Mr. Hagerdon, we welcome you to Qatar and to IC Qatar's Connected Speaker Series. We're very happy to have you here. And first, we'd like to know from you, since this is the, the topic of your session today, how ICT can generally uh, contribute to uh, energy efficiency. Thanks. So, first off, it's great to be here, and I appreciate the welcome. Uh, ICT is actually going to play a huge role in, uh, in, in climate change and, and in increased energy efficiency. I think one of the things that, uh, that's most important about recognizing that is that ICT has uh, the opportunity to make contributions across the range of energy consumption and production. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, it operates by uh, what would say making the grid smarter. Mm -hmm. But what that really means is capturing inefficiencies uh, and, and, uh, and, and by doing so, making the whole grid more efficient. Mm -hmm. So ICT is a solution uh, that sort of applies to all of the problems we have. Mm -hmm. And in that way, I think it distinguishes itself from solar or wind or Mm -hmm. or, or hydro in that it's it's not simply an energy su supply solution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm interested to know that how cloud computing can help lessen carbon footprints and whether you see any further technologies that could arise or could emerge that could also help uh, in sure. the environmental aspect. Sure. Well, uh, cloud computing is going to make a huge difference. I think uh, the ways in which it could help with uh, carbon footprint is particularly uh, the opportunity to uh, get rid of our, our in-home computing devices, mm -hmm. which all tend to, to use a fair amount of electricity, mm -hmm. whether they're on or off. Mm -hmm. And cloud computing makes it an opportunity to, to reduce that energy consumption across all markets, residential and consumer, our business. Mm -hmm. uh, then, now that said, cloud computing could also cause more trouble in that uh, data centers take an enormous amount of energy to run. Mm -hmm. And while they're more efficient than all of us having the equivalent computing power at home, mm -hmm they provide us with much more computing power. Mm -hmm. And that means that uh, a lot of, you know, one of the biggest growths in energy demand right now are coming from those data centers. Mm -hmm. So we have a long way to go to make those more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, and so cloud computing is gonna really have that double-edged sword. It's gonna help us mm -hmm. make our own computing more efficient, but at the same time, the more it becomes ubiquitous, mm -hmm. the more energy it will demand. Mm -hmm. And any further innovations that you believe can, could also help in, in the environmental aspect? In the future, could they could uh, that's, well, particularly around ICT. I think one of the most interesting things about that set of technologies mm -hmm. is that you really can't predict what's going to happen with them. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of innovation, but it's uh, uh, but we don't really know what it is yet. So we we can guess on how it will be applied now, mm -hmm. making a smarter transmission, smarter distribution, smarter energy consumption in the home. Mm -hmm. But we can't guess at how people will come up with new solutions. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes ICT so exciting in the energy space. Mm -hmm. um, a big part of your writings are about ICT innovation. So first, I'd like to know, how can we define innovation? And how is it different from uh, invention? Right. Well, you know, the, the, the big difference uh, around innovation is that despite what it looks like in the media, innovation tends to be new combinations of old ideas. Mm. In fact, what's really driving the, the impact of an innovation isn't the novelty of the idea, mm -hmm. so much as the new business model and new partners that are brought together to make that idea successful. Mm -hmm. uh, in, invention tends to be overblown in the sense that it's focusing on an individual or a particular time mm -hmm. at which an idea happened. Uh, and it gives everybody the idea that, that these, these inventions spring up overnight and can suddenly make change. In fact, those changes take place over decades and are often the result of hard work of new policy shifts and of business innovations, mm -hmm. rather than simply technological solutions coming up. Mm -hmm. I think particularly around energy and the environment, you know, the more we look to inventions to, to save the day, mm -hmm. uh, the more misled we can be in hoping that something will come along that takes the world by storm, mm -hmm. when in fact, uh, those things looking back that took the world by storm mm. weren't inventions. Mm. There were improvements on existing ideas, uh, and often brought to new markets, mm. but they were very clearly building on existing uh, existing technologies and existing people and ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. In some cases, a new innovative idea could be really appealing, and then on the long term, we're not sure if, uh, about its viability and whether it will be, have a risk of obsolescence. So how can we really evaluate uh, an innovative idea in the field of ICT, and how can we make sure that on the long term it will be worth investment or worth uh, considering? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think that the best way to judge a new technology is not by what it does immediately, mm. or even by what it can do as it improves in that particular application, mm. but rather by what it enables others to do in mm. other applications that we haven't really guessed yet. Mm. By that I mean there are some technologies which have a single purpose, 
solar cells, for example, mm. where we can guess uh, how they'll evolve and we can make our predictions about, about the efficiency of solar cells over the next 20 years. Mm. But we know that essentially they're going to be producing power. Mm. What we don't know about, for example, uh, information and communication technology is how they'll be used in the future. Mm. So uh, if we looked to the development of the internet mm. when it was first created in, in 1971, you know, we could never have predicted the uses that it, it, it created for mm. itself. And I think that's the important perspective. When you look at a new opportunity for innovation, mm. uh, it's, it's dangerous to think that you can see it, the, the, the path it will take. Mm. In fact, the path it takes, uh, if you can see it, is probably a problem. Mm. So really, it's, it's, you, know, you want to look for those innovations that have the opportunity to evolve and flourish mm. in ways you, you wouldn't expect. Mm -hmm. In many cases, we're linking between the, a new ICT innovation and productivity. So do you think we should always link between, or should we, could, we could use productivity as the criterion to evaluate uh, an innovation, or what, what are other criteria that could be possible? Well, productivity is a critical, uh, obviously, a critical criteria, mm. because you want, to, you want to make sure that it, it, it contributes immediately. Mm -hmm. Innovation shouldn't uh, cost anything in the, in the long run. Mm. Uh, I mean, by, excuse me, innovation shouldn't cost anything in the short run. Okay. So measuring innovation by productivity, mm -hmm. uh, you should always have a net positive gain. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it should make you more productive. Mm -hmm. But again, what you want to be able to measure an innovation on is not simply productivity mm -hmm. in the way it was intended to be used, mm -hmm. but also productivity and change in the way you would do other things, again, that you wouldn't have expected to do. Mm -hmm. And those changes are very difficult to measure. All you can really measure is the potential. Mm. for those changes. Mm. Okay. In one of your writings, you uh, discussed something called the knowledge brokering cycle. And you mentioned that new ideas are built on old ideas. So can you tell us quickly the phases and how you see this cycle, how it works? <laughs> Just quickly, briefly. You really did your reading. <laughs> <laughs> I did my research. <laughs> well, I think uh, uh, knowledge brokering is really a, a, a recognition that because innovation is a new combination of old ideas, mm. The people that we look to that are generally very innovative have often t found themselves or put themselves in a position mm. where they could see the ideas that are out there already. Mm. And in particular, see the ideas that are out there in markets that, that hadn't yet seen or used those ideas okay. and figure out ways to bring them, bring them in. Yeah. Uh, what that means is that there is sort of a four-step process that my uh, co-author Bob Sutton and I described about knowledge brokering. The first being finding yourself in a position where you can span multiple worlds, where you can see how ideas in one world could be used in another mm -hmm. and find ways to make it work. Mm -hmm. Now, in an organizational setting, what often happens is they need to, um, uh, often they need to come back and, and you know, rarely do you see those ideas right when you need them. Mm -hmm. So often you need to remember them. And how do organizations remember ideas? There, there are a number of different ways from from mm -hmm. good to bad mm -hmm. uh, about organizational memory. Mm -hmm. But you need to remember them. You need to be able to retrieve them wherever they've been remembered in the organization for the time when you need them. Mm -hmm. And then you need to be able to put them together in new combinations. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think uh, uh, the, you know, the big challenge for organizations is, is keeping that memory and then keeping access to the ideas mm -hmm. because people come and go. Mm -hmm. And then finally, being willing to experiment with new combinations of those ideas mm -hmm. as they come up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, you dismissed the idea that uh, innovation comes from a single genius person who's sitting in his laboratory and locked up. And how do you view ICT innovation as a collective activity rather than just uh, a, per a person or per an initiative led by one person, not a not a group? Sure. Well, I think uh, you know uh, ICT in particular, or uh, yeah, I think I ICT is a particularly nice technology in the sense that it, engen it engenders sort of collaborative creativity. Mm. Uh, people uh, are, are very easy, you know, it's very easy for people to see how those technologies are being used mm. and learn from that and, and move forward. I mean, mm. a, a great example of this is, is, the, is the World Wide Web. Mm. Anybody who was developing a, you know, a website or, or web uh, software could see what, else was, what everybody else was doing mm -hmm. and take the best of those ideas and put them together in a new solution themselves. Mm. So rather than a closed system of innovation where one company was off doing one technology and another was off doing another and yeah. they couldn't and, or wouldn't share what they were doing or what they learned, uh, a lot of the very fabric of ICT depends on uh, people seeing what each other are trying to do mm. and, and taking the best and moving forward. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you mentioned in one of your articles also about the idea generation techniques uh, that could be followed in organizations. So how can an organization help its employees, motivate them, or even let them generate the much as much ideas that they could? Uh, you know, brainstorming is, is typically seen of as, the, as the way that organizations can generate new ideas. It's a structured activity mm-hmm. in which teams of people get together and, and really set judgment aside for a while and try and come up with as many different new ideas as they can. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's often been described as you know a, a great cure for the for you know writer's block or creative blocks mm-hmm. in organizations, but oftentimes it it uh, it's also been described by researchers as unproductive, mm-hmm. because in fact individuals if they were if they were to spend that time alone could could in in an aggregate come up with as many ideas. Yeah. But it turns out that in organizations brainstorming has a much broader role than simply getting people together to come up with ideas. It mm. reinforces a culture in which people are encouraged to come up with new ideas. Mm. It increases the sharing among other of each other, you know, among people in an organization about the ideas that they do know. Mm. Um, it, it, it does, a, it does a, you know, it brings people out of their cubicles for a moment to think mm. about the problems that others in the organization are working on. Mm. So there's a range of ways in which brainstorming sort of in the wild, in organizations, has a lot of effects far, you know, far and beyond just coming up with new ideas. Mm. Okay. Uh, my final question. My final question. Uh, you mentioned that um, in order for innovation to flourish, there should be some attitudinal change on the part of organizational leaders or organization thinking. So, how do you think uh, should they? What their, what should their attitudes towards innovation be? How should they think about innovation? Well, there's a couple things that people should do, but uh, leaders especially. One of those things is to encourage uh, prototyping, iteration, Mm -hmm. trying an idea out. So often leaders are in a very good position to simply say, uh, uh, no, we don't want to do that. Now, sometimes that's critical. And and if you look at Steve Jobs at Apple, for example, some of the best decisions he made were the ones he said no in. Mm -hmm. You know, not letting Apple get distracted by doing too many projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's just so many opportunities. But at the same time, a leader also needs to know when and how to say yes. And rather than saying yes and committing the organization to a particular path that they believe is right, Mm -hmm. oftentimes the best thing a leader can do is say yes to building prototypes or testing the assumptions that that, that they and their organization are making. Mm -hmm. So so first off, a leader needs to keep the organization focused on what they want to do. The second thing is they need to keep them focused on action, on building prototypes, on testing their assumptions about about what opportunities there are for innovation. Mm-hmm. And then lastly, execution. Mm-hmm. You know, what a leader can really do is once the decision has been made to, to bring a new innovation forward, is to focus on execution and making it happen. Because oftentimes, uh, even though somebody in the organization has, has championed an innovation, there are a lot of other people in the organization who lie in waiting mm-hmm. to bring the idea back down. Yeah. And so uh, a leader it really needs to throw their weight, once they've committed, to throw their weight behind that innovation and make it happen. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for these uh, lovely insights.